So today is Dr. Brown, Dr. Edelstein Brown, uh, Harvard, Oxford, Rhodes Scholar, private sector, public sector. I can't say anything more. Dr. Brown. Great. Thanks, Anton. Great. So I'm looking for the one piece of technology I still need. Thanks. So today I'm going to talk about caregivers. We all know caregivers. There are mothers who are taking care of fathers who have aged harder and faster somehow. There are a partner who's gotten off the career track to stay at home and take care of a sick child. There are neighbors who are working to do everything to ensure that a handicapped sister or handicapped brother is actually part of the neighborhood, part of the community. For most of us, or actually for a lot of us, caregiver is actually the person we see in the mirror every morning. And although they're largely unpaid, untrained, unregulated, and often unthanked, caregivers are the largest team, the largest workforce in our healthcare system. One in five Ontarians right now is a caregiver. So they're all around us. But over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to argue that they're actually disappearing. And the day that we stop caring is closer at hand than we all think. But the forces driving this disappearance, this decline, are well beyond the healthcare system. And during the middle part of this talk, I'm going to argue that this really isn't a healthcare problem. This is a whole system problem. There's broad social and demographic trends that are making the caregivers disappear. There's business practices that are discouraging caregivers from taking up the burden. And there's a range of factors associated with the web of rules, services, and practices in our health and social care system that actually get in the way of caregiving. So it's a classic complex problem. And as such, it's not amenable, it's not suitable to the way that we typically develop policy. The usual ways of a literature review, some thoughtful discussion internally, won't actually solve the caregiving problem. It may actually accelerate it. So we're also going to talk today about some new ways of doing policy. Some of them are low tech. The usual routine of the right people in the right room with the right evidence at the right time. But instead of our usual hand at a 15-person expert panel focused on a clinical question or a focus group of 20 or 25 people, we're talking about 300 people now in something called long-range planning or long-range scenario planning. 300 people who are experts coming together in a highly organized process to actually think about what the future holds and how we plan for the uncertainty that is inherent in the future. We'll also talk about some high-tech ways of trying to figure out what's important to Ontarians using tools like Google that we use every day for simple tasks, but that can actually inform policy, not just on what would work, but what's important to people in our community. And I'll argue uh, at the end of the day, and although we'll throw around sums in the millions and the billions of dollars throughout this talk, most of the solutions to the caregiving crisis that's coming are actually low cost, often low tech, and have much to more to do with the expectations that we place on ourselves and the opportunities we're willing to create for each other than they do about dollars or service volumes, the two ways that we typically approach health policy. So if someone would cue some forbidding music, we'll actually get into a talk about how bad it's going to be. So this is what caregivers look like in Ontario today. I'm not going to sit here and call out all the numbers, but this actually isn't a bad picture. Some expected things, women are a little more common in this group than men. It's a little more affluent group than you might have thought about, given the burdens of caregiving that often is a, uh, an issue of equity involved here. But not too much uh, to say here other than it's really our population. And it's not surprising. Most people are caregivers at one point in their lives, so the population should look like, uh, should look like us. But actually, the burden isn't quite so simple. So about three quarters of people care for one person. That's the type of relationship we understand. That's the relationship that's in our business policies and practices, the things that are covered under uh, EAP. But there's a three, uh, 25%, almost another quarter of the people out there who are caring for two, three, up to eight people. It's not family size. That's caregiving burden. These are people who are involved actually in receiving care on a regular daily basis. And it's not all a younger sister, a younger brother, a younger person. A large proportion, this is data from Marcus Hollander, a large proportion of the people who are engaged in caregiving 
are themselves in that age range that's usually eligible for caregiving. So this is now starting to paint a little different picture. Sure, it looks like us, but there's a lot of people who are engaged in a long-term relationship here who themselves are becoming more vulnerable, fragile, and frail. And perhaps this is where the forbidding music actually does start to come in. Well, again, I won't read out these numbers, but this is where this burden starts to translate into real, real issues. One in five Ontarians is a caregiver. One in six Ontarians is reporting that caregiving gets in the way of making a living. The other one that I think is remarkable here is that although one in four have no help, two out of three say they need a lot more help than what they have. So we're starting to get a sense of the precarious balance here, the fact that this is maybe not all that supportable. And there is a human cost to this as well. We all experience stress. Anyone who owns a car in Toronto experiences stress on a daily basis. I don't own a car, so I'm remarkably happy. That's why I'm this height. <laughs> but one in two stress, not so bad. But what about if one in 10, one in five are starting to experience actual physical symptoms associated with that caregiving? Not surprising. If you think about the tasks that are involved in caregiving, and then imagine that a whole bunch of those people themselves are over 65 years of age. We put lifts into hospitals to help younger people move patients around. Imagine what happens when you're in a home that's not set up for caregiving. What's also here is that there's an incredible emotional toil. The people who are recipients of caregiving, people with dementia, Alzheimer's, a variety of different diseases, they're not awful sure where they are. And there can be abusive and difficult relationships, but it even goes beyond those sorts of conditions. It's challenging for everyone involved in the caregiving relationship. What I think is perhaps the most worrisome statistic on this, leading from that idea that you know, a lot of our caregivers are over 65, almost one in five of our caregivers themselves need some form of caregiving. So it's starting to get a little more precarious, but this is the way it's always been, right? You have a friend of mine said to me yesterday in conversation, she was repeating a story from her mother, why else did I have kids? <laughs> Well, it's changing a little bit. So we know it's aging. We know that we're getting older as a population. But as long as we've got kids, as long as we've got those normal social networks, this isn't a problem. Everyone's seen this story about the silver tsunami. I'm going to argue this actually isn't the problem. Aging isn't the problem. It's the rest of the population that's the problem as we go along here. So it's called the crossover point. This is when we have more people over 65 than we do under 15 in this country. The crossover point is only five years away. And so if you think that the over 65 are the people who are getting ready for caregiving, the under 15 are the team that's getting ready to help provide that care. And all of a sudden, there's more people over 65 than there are in that sort of team that's going to feed the support for that. But it's more. Over the last five years, that nuclear family, that idea of, you know, that insurance policy, let's call it, that we can all create. That's declined by almost 20% over five years. We're in a place now where single-person households are a lot more common than that sort of family unit that will provide the caregiving. And this broad social trend will only accelerate. We're thankfully in a society now that acknowledges that people have a lot of options about how they want to live their lives, and that's excellent but it starts to shift away from a variety of the structures that have created at least an informal care network over a while. And when you now stretch this out to 2050, you can see that we have about one and a half to two times as many seniors as we do younger people, and the dependency ratio is almost unsupportable. Let me put this in context for you. Years ago when we started our big social benefit programs, and, uh, through the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s, there was maybe one person retired, one person needing support for 10, 15, 20 people working. When we get to this place, there's going to be one person working for every two, three, four, five people who need support. So the dependency burden or the uh, dependency ratio will be huge. Well, this is just a standard health policy problem, right? Let's throw some money at it. So Marcus Hollander looked at this a little while ago, and even today, if we did nothing more than pay caregivers for the work they do, because they're disappearing, we're going to have to bring people in to do this sort of work, it'd be about $24 billion in this country. If we actually paid them for the type of work they do, 
not just at a homemaker sort of basic level, but we pay them for the type of work they're going to do, it goes up to over $30 billion, and that's today. Extrapolating that out on uh, some of our own work now here, building off of uh, Marcus Hollander's work, you can see that by the time I'm 60, well before I retire, it's going to be a $50 billion price tag just to give minimum wage. But we know that minimum wage doesn't drag people into jobs and doesn't drag people into employment sectors. If we pay them what they're worth, it will be $63 billion. Now, these are Canadian statistics, but to give you an idea of the relationship between this number and the size of our healthcare system today, we spend $42 billion across our entire healthcare system today. This is one and a half times we'll be spending now on caregiving. So it's like someone built an entire another Ontario and added in another half of the province on top of that, and not the, you know, the uh, lightly populated half. This is adding in another Toronto and said, you need, you're now responsible for that health care system. So it's almost unsustainable from a financial perspective. And just to make the point, about the time that the costs start to accelerate, the proportion of people who are young who can start to work into that caregiving workforce has flatlined. And while this, those bars will continue to climb, that line, that available workforce, will stay flat. So it is actually a challenge. And it's a challenge that's actually accelerated by medical success. So one of the great successes that I think often is unsung in healthcare is what we can do for kids now. Frail, fragile, vulnerable children who 10, 15 years ago would have died live with us now and live with us actually in a way that allows them to have a life inside of their community. I'll go back to a quote in a few minutes from uh, the parent of one of these children. But we will very shortly find ourselves in a place where about 2% of all children have serious disability. So it's not just going to be adults. It's going to be kids as well. This is going to be a second argument I'm going to make. It's not just aging that's the problem. The problem is vulnerability. And there's a lot of people who are both strong and vulnerable at the same point but they're going to require a phenomenal amount of caregiving. These are kids who, uh, let's make this clear, for some of these children, oxygen tents at home, catheterization at home, you know, advanced nursing happening in someone's living room. So this is not a light caregiving burden as we go along. So we can sketch out a very frightening picture. There's lots of people who work in healthcare who can sketch out a frightening picture of different magnitudes. I see people in the audience who spent a long time thinking about healthcare finance. That's another one of our frightening pictures that we're not going to talk about too much today. We have the problems of safety and quality in our system that also are important. Is it really time to talk about caregiving? Don't we have enough on our plate? Well, this is where things like Google can start to help. It's one thing to go out on the street and ask a whole bunch of people a question. It's another thing to have a focus group. There's the standard cocktail party uh, approach where you ask people what's on their mind. What if you could find out what people were searching for on the web? Well, what if you actually find out where people are trying to find out about caregiving? So this is a Google analytic technique that allows you to look at who's searching for what and start to compare it across countries. So it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a couple countries the Philippines, Fiji, Nepal, these are actually exporters of caregiving. This is where our caregivers come from. They're in the dark blue. The top importing country in terms of searching for caregiving is right here. It's Canada. So when you want to find out who's really concerned about caregiving, it's actually Canadians. And we can use the web to start to find out these types of uh, factors. OK, so maybe it's not Ontario, right? We always have the joke that Ontario is the control group in any health system reform because things are working fine here right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's the darkest? What's number one in the ranking? So interestingly enough, when you let people try to find the information that's important to them, what rises to the top in all of this is actually caregiving. So it probably is time to start talking about caregiving. So what are people looking for? Well, it's interesting. You can actually then look for these words across different countries. So let's look at Canada. Look across the different... I don't expect anyone here to play bingo or do anything very quickly with this. But there's a couple interesting things here I want to call out. The first is, this is a human resources issue. This is something where people are already looking for support. So I can make a case that we're going to face a rate of burnout that's huge in the future. I can paint a very, very frightening picture at the edge of a precipice 
in 20 years. But we're already actually at that place where, at least as individuals, we're looking for help now on a daily basis. So if you look at what's up in Canada, it's finding caregivers, living caregivers, caregiver programs, nannies, all these sorts of things. One other thing that's interesting here, as I'm making the case that this is now a mainstream issue, carry the caregiver. So what's carry the caregiver? Is this the top nanny? It's actually a game. So, you know, we get a little worried about kids playing games with violence and destruction. We get a little worried about kids playing games with explicit content. Kids are playing games as caregivers now. This is an interesting game. You go on, it's got great graphics and a variety of other things, but it presents you with problems that seem somewhat mundane and banal. How do you get to see all of your clients in a day? How do you fit in a variety of activities in a relatively crowded schedule? So actually, this is now mainstream to the point that kids and adults are playing this game online. And this is about as innocuous and innocent as it seems, but this is what they see in their lives, and these are the games that they start to play. So this really is now an issue that's got its time and we're ready to talk about. This is something called a tag cloud. And so what you do is you go on a website, and you look for the most common words, and then the size of the word indicates its importance. So this is the top 100 uh, caregiver-related organization websites and what the biggest keywords are. So it's big issues that, well, kind of make sense to us, right? It's about caregiving. I'm glad that's big. Family is huge there because this is often about maintaining a geographically tight family, keeping family close to us. There's care. But it's interesting to start to look at all the words around the outside. There's all the diseases that we know are getting more and more common. It's kind of a little bit of a mosaic of chronic disease, often chronic diseases we aren't paying a lot of attention to from a policy perspective. But there's other words, too, like burnout, syndrome, and things that start to get pretty frightening when you see what people are searching on and what they're talking about. Now, this is a little bit different. These are the top keywords on the caregiver-related blogs. So blogs are the places where people go to talk about issues that are important to them. This is probably a lot more about caregivers themselves, the people working. It's a very different set of words. And we can analyze these words and look at it. I'm going to call a couple of uh, differences in the language to your attention, though. First, it's just different words. So the people who are trying to work on this are talking about different things from the people who are working in this area. That's a problem. We're getting to the complexity of the problem, or this classic complex problem. And the people who are actually working are using different language than the people who are organizing this. So there's an opportunity for a whole bunch of problems to emerge here, social divides, inequities, and a variety of other challenges. So it's a classic complex problem. It's very hard to understand where we'd go with this over the future, because the future is pretty uncertain. So there is a, a new technique, or not a new technique, but a new technique for government called long-range scenario planning. No one can predict the future, but what you can do is draw out visions of what the future might look like. And then, after you've got a series of scenarios, you actually start to plot for the robust themes across those scenarios. So regardless of how the future evolves around caregiving, we're going to have to deal with the following three issues. They're common to any view of the future. And you can also start to call in and pull attention or, or develop policy in relationship to the critical issues in each scenario. Well, if it goes a certain way, we know we have to deal with this or else we'll find not $63 billion bill, but a $163 billion bill. So uh, again, thanks to the people who actually participated in this, we started off, we looked at what the broad trends were. We'll talk about those in a second uh, with about uh, 30 health experts. We worked on what the implications of those were, so big issues like legal liability. What does that actually mean for the caregiving world as we go forward? And we dragged in 120 people from across the province in a very organized and focused group. That went to 150 people who then developed the four scenarios. What are the possible ways our future in caregiving might evolve? And then 300 people to help us understand what the robust themes are and some of the policy options that I'm going to lay out here. Again looking at that future and saying, what will we have to deal with, regardless of how it evolves? And very shortly, we'll have the policy options and some of the leading indicators, where the world is going and how we know uh, when it's tracking that way. So this is the, uh, people should know, I'm a former consultant, and every consultant knows how to do a chart with several balls on it. 
Uh, and it's, it's a way of expressing to you how complex the world is uh, and encouraging you to spend more on consultants. So uh, <laughs> that's trick number one. Uh, what you can see there is a variety of uh, major issues. These are the sorts of trends and, uh, and broad issues there that were identified by this group. A lot of them have nothing to do with caregiving per se, but they're the factors that shape caregiving. We can start to organize those into a variety of themes, pull out the core issues that are going to be driving different futures. These are, uh, in many ways, again, very separate from the question of who's doing caregiving, the technical aspects of caregiving, cultural duties, balance, the value of independence versus interdependence. These are big social questions and value issues that may actually divide us. Again, it's a complex problem. It's not a simple problem. There's a lot going on here. There's big enablers, really our legal environment and our technology environment that will also help to drive activity here. And together, they take us to four different views of how the world of caregiving might evolve. One, caring from a distance. It used to be that you only knew the town you were born in. It used to be that you walked to work. Who here lives within two or three blocks of their parents now? Who can walk to their parents? OK. Who makes a regular trip, maybe Christmas, Thanksgiving, a holiday to their parents? OK. So we're getting an attenuated family situation. Caring from a distance is one of the major themes about how we might actually work on caregiving. Design for living, communities that actually organized around seniors, appreciating care, actually revitalizing what it is that's valuable in caregiving, calling attention to it. I said untrained, unregulated, unpaid, often, unfortunately, also unthanked. And finally, neighbor's keeper, revitalizing a community spirit that actually takes the bounds well beyond just who you're related to, but who you want to be related to. Working through those scenarios, we identified eight big themes of policy, 23 very concrete actions, but eight big themes of policy that we might pursue to try to keep control, at least, on the challenges of caregiving that are coming forward in the future. 23 of them there, and I'll spend the rest of the talk this morning actually going through what those options are and what we might do. But first, I want to go to this chart. These are the same 23 ideas you just saw on the last page, ranked two different ways, by the overall priority and by what's actually a priority for public policy, what's a government priority. And I want to call attention to three things on this page. First, the overall priority for society, really increasing access to information, enabling navigation through the system, promoting caregiver education, that theme around a more educated system, isn't a priority for public policy. There's a whole bunch of things that people, when they sit down, actually expect the private sector, they expect the health sector, they expect the rest of the world to do. Interesting, the number one priority for public policy has almost no cost associated with it. It's actually redefining who caregivers are. It's about creating the types of situations that we have for children already, but creating them for adults. And I'll talk a little more about that. So there's a very big divide. This isn't all government, and it isn't all the private sector. Nor will it actually work unless we bring all these parties to the same table. So the first theme, reconstructing the policy definition of the caregiver. Big policy issue. What does this practically mean? Well, this means allowing a whole range of different people to be caregivers, and perhaps most importantly, more than one person to be a caregiver. Who's heard the term sole caregiver? I'm the sole caregiver for this person. Well, that's not a reality. And in fact, in most cases, it's a network of people. But you actually can't get, in most plans, the opportunity to be part caregiver. So we have to redefine who is a caregiver and accept a whole new range of people. Uh, as caregivers into our policy and our legislative framework. Also ensuring a system of protection for care recipients. We have a child welfare system. Actually works pretty well as an early warning system for what's going on with kids. Lots of problems, lots of challenges, but it works okay. We don't have something for adults. As I listen to the stories that people tell me about adults living in small areas, behind shops, working through a variety of different issues, trying to live on their own, there is no way of uh, an early warning system of finding out who's vulnerable and who's going to be at risk. So a lot we can do just changing the definition and leveraging off of the structures that we already have in our system. 
paying attention to the changing forms of social connection and building on social networks. I said sole caregiver is kind of a myth. Reality, it's usually three to five people. It's a network. But we don't treat it as a network. So things that we might do, build off of neighborhood hubs. Every community has all sorts of neighborhood hubs. And we've heard a lot about neighborhood hubs reinforcing the swimming pool, the community center, those sorts of places. Well, those should also be a place for supporting and actually recruiting caregivers in. Strategic investments in social cooperatives. If you go to Japan now, there's 100,000 seniors as who are part of a cooperative where the stronger seniors, the less frail seniors, take care of the more frail seniors. It's simply a cooperative. Seems kind of a far stretch to go out and recruit a whole bunch of seniors now into a cooperative, but it doesn't start like that. You look for the associations right now that are built on culture, friendship, interest, and those are legion in our society. And you start to make the investments in those groups, small investments, so they can start to take care of themselves as they get older. And if the big issue is about social integration, bringing people together, making them part of a community, reaching out, helping them with some of the basic activities of daily living, that's actually a relatively small investment. Building a system for social networking. I've already talked about the importance of networks. Let's not kid ourselves. Seniors, older adults are online. They are part of online communities. It's not Facebook. It's things like ReZoom. It's things like Boomertown. And they're there. We've already got the social networking. We're not using that opportunity and directing it towards caregiving. But that, again, is pretty simple. That is something for the communications area. Implementing good neighbors legislation. So we all accept the value of good Samaritan legislation, right? If you stop to help someone who's in extreme distress and you do your best to help them, well, they shouldn't be held liable for that, right? That seems like a reasonable reflection of our social values. Most people aren't in extreme distress. You may drive by three or four traffic accidents in your entire life. You'll walk by 30 or 40 houses or apartments every day where someone actually needs that regular care. So it's about shifting a little bit of the legal liability. If you've been a good neighbor, working, trying to help, remove some of the legal liability around that. But that can't be done on its own. So is this, a, is this an interesting idea? Is neighborhood important or social hubs important? Let's go back to Google. You can actually see here now, working through this, that in Ontario, neighborhood is a big issue. Only place where it's a little more important is the states. Here's Ontario, major, major issue for us as we look at this. All right, we're still in relatively low cost interventions. These are small investments. We're in the hundreds of thousands and millions category. What about value and caregiving? So it's interesting, we started off and we heard about the importance of coming in a few weeks to listen to someone who represents what? The hospital association. And it's a valued, important voice on how our healthcare system is going to evolve. I accept it entirely. Who is the voice for caregivers? So there's lots of people who claim part of that voice. There's lots of people who argue somewhat for that. Compared to the United Kingdom, compared to the United States, compared to a variety of other jurisdictions, there is no organized voice for caregivers who can come to the table. So this is simply about creating an association. It's an easy idea again. Strengthening Ontario's awareness of the informal caregiving role. So again, uh, let me ask a question. We all know caregivers. Who actually thinks on a daily basis about what the tasks of all those other caregivers are? When you get into your health class in high school, and you learn about sexual health, maybe health promotion. We all learn about the importance of keeping our teeth uh, clean. Who actually gets taught about how you help someone? No one. So we can actually start to strengthen the awareness in the informal caregiving role. We can change what it means to be a best employer. In a second, I'm going to show a quote from British Telecom, from BT, about how important caregiving is to being a good employer and how it makes business sense. This is easy again. You want to be a top 100 employer? You want to use that as a way to pull people in? Make a requirement of that actually being flex time, opportunities to expand or, or work within that caregiver role. And reanimating volunteerism. So it's interesting, we have a campaign every year in the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care called Federated Health Charities, and it's a big event. And it does pretty well. It raises hundreds of thousands of dollars for a range of health charities. But uh, this is kind of a tough year, right? Everyone's expecting donations to go down. What if it actually was Federated Health where you could give money, or time. 
So there's a way of actually reanimating volunteers, and I'll talk a little more about that as we go on, but uh, it's simply creating an opportunity for that. Fourth theme, technology. Stimulating the development of technology-enabled systems. We've all seen the TV ads for this. Okay, so you watch TV after 9 o'clock, sooner or later you see the old Surgeon General of the United States and someone who looks very frail at home with their little lifeline button, right? Well, there's a whole range of these activities. There's things that can tell you whether or not the stove is on. There's things that can tell you whether or not someone's fallen. There's devices that can work with people now to help them prevent falling. That's simple. Grab bars, slip strips, and those sorts of simple things right through to orthotics that actually keep people upright. So there's a variety of things that we can do using technology to keep people safe at home. We can also create virtual communities. So who's made a hotel reservation, a plane reservation, gone on to Amazon in the last little while? And basically, if you've used the web, right, you've bought something. Did you have to figure out the local website? Did you have to go to the website for downtown Toronto or the website over here? No, single point. Single point, single clearinghouse, broad community aggregated resources shared out. We can use virtual technology now to start to create some of these hubs. And it's relatively cheap again. Would people actually use this? Well, back to Google. Who's actually searching for caregiving and home care technology? The states in this case actually leads. Number two is Canada. So these are issues that people are already looking for and already searching for. So we can use these new techniques like Google to see whether or not this is useful for people. What about timely access to reliable information? This is a hallmark of the healthcare system, right? If people just had access, they'd do a lot better. Well, it's true here as well. Part of that's a structure to enable system navigation. Four or five years ago, I started sitting through a lot of focus groups with people off of the street. And it's interesting, uh, you know, you'll have one focus group that'll be people who don't have a lot of money, are really struggling to make ends meet. You'll go into another focus group, there'll be a group of people who have a lot of money, they're regular users of the healthcare system, they're educated. What's the common need in both groups? Well, it's a particularly Canadian expression that keeps on coming up. I need someone to help me stick handle my way through the healthcare system. So imagine if it's difficult for all of us who can come here, walk in, sit down. Imagine what it's like for someone who can't necessarily do all those tasks. There's no integrated management, no integrated pathway, no support for figuring out how you link together services that, at least if they're coming from government, could span four ministries, each with its own uh, assessment forms, eligibility rules, different offices. And you see the tragedy sometimes of this if you go into uh, some of the government offices of people wandering from place to place, filling out lots of forms, and quite frankly, getting a little confused. What about caregiver education? I said untrained. There's basic training that we could look at. How do you get to all of these services? How do you navigate through all these services? What are the warning signs? You talk to a parent who's taking care of a handicapped child at home. They've actually had to educate themselves in many cases and work towards figuring out what the warning signs are for their own kids. As we go to a place where there are oxygen tents at home, there are catheters at home, there are intravenous lines at home, we're going to have to think about educating now what is the largest part of our healthcare system. And this will cause, you know, not arguing for a college of caregivers, I'm not arguing for a regulated profession, I'm arguing for a basic level of education here. In many ways, it can be done virtually again. So promoting opportunity and source for, uh, or sources of support. So, big thing here, creating a formal process for caregiver assessment. How do you know if you're doing it well? It's interesting, when you talk to people who are trying to take care of a family member with cancer at home, talk to them at the beginning of the journey, and they'll say, I really want to keep my mom, my brother, my sister, my father, my child at home. About two-thirds of the way through the journey, I can't handle this. I just don't know what to do. I'm faced by uncertainty. And these people end up separated from their family in a hospital. In fact, this is an, a number that's going backwards in this province. There are more and more people every year who are actually dying in a hospital rather than being close to family and at home. Well, in often case, it's just the lack of preparation for this. So we could assess people, get them tooled up, make sure that they have an opportunity to see how good they are and give them some confidence. We could actually empower informal caregivers through self-directed care, and I'll, I'll go to that quote in a second about this, but this is actually making money follow the person. 
doesn't work in every case, but it does give a number of people who are able to the opportunity to make choices about where and what sort of care they want to receive. Building a system of support through stable and efficient investments. This is going to be a hard issue. It's not a big dollar issue, but it's a hard issue. Dan Wright's sitting over here, and he could talk to you at long length about the importance of supply chain management, about back office consolidation, how we do simple things, not core to the business of healthcare, but simple things to make everything more efficient. Well, think about the thousands and thousands of caregiving organizations out there right now. Think about some of the issues we're talking about. Use of technology, navigation, standardized tools. You wouldn't want those thousands and thousands of organizations, often run by a mother or a father or a committed individual who's had an experience with a particular disease, to now have to do all of that. You know, the terrible irony. We'll support you in what you're doing, but please first fill out 40 pages. Oh, oh and you should have your lawyer look at it. Oh, and your privacy counsel. Uh, and try to do it electronically, will you? Well, it doesn't work that way. So there's issues, uh, hard questions, but probably at the end of the day, good questions to deal with. Should we start to provide back office consolidation for all of the caregivers around the province? Should we standardize some of these services? Should we create a single point of contact? Uh, adopting a triple bottom line. So this is a new thing. It goes by a lot of different words, corporate social responsibility, accountability for society, social accountability. It's basically three things, people, planet, profits. And so, you can actually get to a place where a good corporation, what corporations that want to sell you their services, their results, their activities, their products, have three bottom lines. First one is people. That bottom line could be a real critical part of it. And we'll talk about BT in a second around that. And building a system of support through flexible and private hubs. So, who drives through suburban Toronto every once in a while? Okay, you see all the primary schools? Five, ten years, they're going to be empty. So it would be terrible now if we start to build these hubs that I talked about earlier on, and they're fixed far away from where the care needs are going to be at the end of the day. So these hubs that we build also need to be flexible, and that's going to involve technology. It's going to involve, actually, vans, the types of things that we've seen already in our system. But we'll need to build flexible and portable hubs that can follow need. This is the first of the quotes I wanted to go to. So this is the father of a young man in Toronto. And he participated in our caregiving group, that long-range scenario planning activity that I talked about. And so here's the story. They've redapted their house to create an apartment for this young man. This young man, despite being quadriplegic and facing a variety of other challenges in his life, has finished high school. He volunteers at a senior center. He communicates through PowerPoint. Well, he's actually found ways to link to the rest of the world. The family has created a circle of care in the community, in the neighborhood, which actually means that the neighbors get together and they figure out ways to make sure they take advantage of this person who's got a lot to contribute in the community. He's about to turn 18 or 19. He's about to graduate from high school. What's the policy? Well, the policy is he should go into a group home. The group home's not next door. The group home's on the other side of the city. So you'll have someone who's actually built and integrated themselves into a community, who's got a productive life, you know, vulnerable, but still very strong. And we're going to destroy that through a simple policy because we don't trust people to spend money in the ways that we want them to spend it. So we now have, thanks actually to Camille Orridge, who's over there, we have a program of one right now. We have some self-directed funding. And we're going to trust people to do the right thing here. But the money will allow him to stay at home, the money will allow him to actually continue in that community. And probably rather than watching a very rapid decline as he shifted, as he loses all his connections, uh, we'll actually see someone who's probably got an even longer life. And although that's more burden and so on, that's actually a success story, I think. OK, competing and caring with flexible benefits and supports. We don't talk with business about this. In fact, we don't talk with business about a lot of things in healthcare. Maybe we're starting to learn some of the lessons. New leadership will get us to talk about things like e-health. We don't actually bring to the same table a discussion about how to solve our, our mutual problems. So what about starting to create tax credits, opportunities, supports, recognition programs? Again, all things that government can do to support businesses that endorse the caregiving role and that support the caregiving role. 
Uh, we can also build benefits and employment protection for informal caregivers. But at the end of the day, it's actually just good business sense. The dialogue itself may be enough if we can make the case. So this is British Telecom. This is a giant corporation with offices in scores of countries, hundreds of thousands of employees. And they did something odd. They said, actually, if you want to take care of someone, we'll work around that. And that ranges from maternity care right through to care of a, uh, a loved one who's very, very ill. And what happened is, saved them about $375 million. What's one of the big drivers here? You stop having to retrain people. So usually when you take a break to take care of someone, it's not just a, t a break in going to that office, it's a break in work. And as the health uh, problem progresses, it's a break from a large chunk of society. So you end up retraining people. We've just had uh, two kids in our family, uh, not a smart decision. Uh, but my wife's taken a break. And it's great that she can do that. But it'll be a major challenge to re-enter the workforce at some point. BT, 99% come back to the same job. So imagine that your largest source of retraining, one of your largest HR challenges, and we all read stories about building culture and building teams and building skills and reinforcing that. Imagine if that kind of disappeared almost overnight. So there's a remarkable good business case here as we go forward with this. And Ontarians actually start to find this an important issue. Parental leave now, thankfully, is, uh, is part of our, uh, our makeup in this province. That's a very strong and valuable step forward. But Ontarians continue to search for this. Again, you can see we're at the top of the chart there, well ahead of other jurisdictions that do have parental leave policies. Here's where it actually gets a little harder, and it does start to involve dollars, though. So equity and vulnerable populations. Who you are, where you work, determines your ability to actually take care of someone. Well, okay, maybe that's okay. But there's a whole layering on top of that. What works for me as a caregiver won't work for someone else as a caregiver. You know, Toronto's the most diverse city in the world right now. They say, was it 150 languages spoken here every day? Huge differences in the traditions of how people try to keep people at home. For a number of cultures, it's a sign of failure for someone to go into a long-term care home. It's a sign of failure if you can't keep someone at home. It's a sign of embarrassment. But often, particularly among new Canadians, they're the exact people who don't have the support to keep people at home. So we probably need to engage in a real dialogue, not just about health benefits, not just about drugs, that's an important question, but actually about the range of benefits and protections in our system that actually drive health and sustain the healthcare system uh, a lot more in the long run. We also need to think about outreach and wraparound. So this is actually a bit of a heartbreaking quote. Someone who's lived their whole life in a community, one of the nations that we, uh, we acknowledge and make up part of Canada, and they go somewhere where they're completely stripped of that community. And what's the best way to make sure that someone faces a rapid decline? cut their social connections, cut their ability to relate to other people. There's studies that have shown that if seniors can get out and do their grocery shopping, if they can go and talk to someone every day, they live a lot longer. It's remarkably cheap intervention. But we don't have outreach and wraparound services that keep people in their communities. We move them rather than moving the services to them. So what are ways, though, we could start to get around this? So this is Twitter. Does anyone know what Twitter is? Do people know what Twitter is? It's at least everyone's read about Twitter, right? Uh, Ashton Kutcher's the first Twitter millionaire. There's a million people following, wanting to know what one of the most important celebrities in Hollywood does on a daily basis. Well, you know, all that aside, a million people are willing to follow someone and get rapid updates on ways that they can live their life, at least according to Ashton. Caregiving's starting to filter in this. I don't expect that anyone who Twitters on Caregiver will have a million followers, but it is a rapid virtual tool that reflects the way that we need advice on a daily basis. So you don't want to go on and read an essay. You don't want to download the real most recent paper from the Journal of the American Medical Association on caregiving. Geez, it would be really great if you could throw a question out there and get a quick answer, just like you might on a hospital ward, just like you might on any type of information service. So Twitter's an option. A lot of Twittering right now in caregiving. It's a lot about getting access to resources, finding those supports. There's a lot of resources, though, starting to show up with more than just where to get help. It's how to do it better at home. Guidelines. 
When we talk about the challenge of guidelines and best practices in clinical care, lots of opportunities to download, so even in a Twitter situation. But at the end of the day, I'd argue that 23 ideas we've thrown up here, two-thirds of them are low cost to no cost. Things that we could do right now to make sure that that shrinking population stays engaged in caregiving and actually push that dependency ratio back up. So that if you're 65 or 75, you're not receiving the care, you're actually providing some of the care. And I don't think at least the people who are the policy leaders in this country would disagree with it. The Senate of Canada did a report this year. Substantial need to build a strategy for caregivers. Japan, 50% more elders. But they've got the social cooperatives. They're using technology. It's a show on, again, I, I said I had two, late, uh, two young kids, two under two. I watch a lot of late night television. They had a show about all the Japanese seniors over 100 who are still working. They're still part of a community. And it's not that they get up every morning, they do everything for themselves, they go to work and they fit into society just as if they're younger. No, no, there's a network of supports around them that actually values both receiving care, that's an appropriate social response, but also providing care. Australia has a whole range of policies right now, partly uh, due to the fact I expect that they have a good advocacy group, but also partly because they see this, particularly given their challenges of distance like ours, as something that's essential to maintaining their system. It's good business, whether your business perspective is the perspective of a corporation or your perspective is the perspective of a big government providing a lot of services. We've got research right now that talks about self-directed and discretionary care cutting 50% of our long-term care costs. And we have a major crisis, and everyone will uh, talk and I think recognize the major crisis we face in ALC. We'll probably make some progress. In fact, I'm sure we'll make some progress given the interventions that are underway right now. But just wait till that tidal wave of people who are unsupported hits the hospitals. 15 and 20% ALC won't be the concern. It'll be the ALC patient who's still in the emergency department. So it's actually a great way to get people at home and staying at home. Uh, and I think also the people who are not only the, the policy people, not only the people who are the business people, but the people who are leaders within our system in a lot of areas, I can see this starting to work right now. And it's interesting. I usually get letters in government telling me why I've disappointed a person, uh, sometimes quite personal letters about the way that we've disappointed people. This is one of the first times that we've gotten letters saying, oh, by the way, that policy work you're doing, speed it up. By the way, that policy work you're doing, tell us how we can help. By the way, that policy work that you're doing, well, that's great. It merely makes me more disappointed in your other work. So. <laughs> it's something that really pulls people in. I mean, people are ready for this. And when we rank it about cost, I don't expect anyone to actually pass this eye test, but you can see most of them are low cost and low risk. There's models in other jurisdictions, there's some certainty about the likely costs, and there's simple things about signaling the importance of caregiving. I had dinner with a friend last night and she came up with a great idea. What about a once a year campaign? Who here knows someone who's disabled? What if everyone who knows someone who's disabled gave up a day a year to take care of that person? Just once a year. It's kind of a compelling idea. There's lots of ways that we can reanimate volunteerism quite cheaply within our system. Just social marketing. What if we actually went into our province's high schools and said, you know what? Part of learning to be a member of this society is actually volunteering in a caregiving role. It's a requirement. It's actually a requirement at those expensive schools that everyone wants to send their kids to. Why isn't it a requirement at the schools for everyone? So there's lots of ways that are cheap, easy, and can really dramatically reanimate and reinvigorate our, uh, our caregiving community. Here's a few things that will cost money. But if we just start on the low cost things right now, I think we could make a substantial progress. But I've, I've made a, a couple, at least a couple provocative uh, assertions so far. Aging's not the problem, it's the rest of the population. Aging's not the problem, it's vulnerability that's the problem. Here's the third one. It's not a healthcare problem. Very few of the policy options we've come forward with are the typical healthcare policies of build something, expand something, provide more of something, or regulate something. In fact, most of the solutions that we're talking about happen outside the normal domain of health policy of hospitals, doctor's offices, long-term care homes, and home care institutions. This is a whole system problem. 
Jane Jensen probably says it best here. Uh, it's going to require action on a lot of different fronts. But I think that's a very valuable point to close on because this isn't about fewer dollars. This isn't actually about a health outcome. This is as much about allowing people to express themselves and realize the life that's important for them. It's about restoring dignity to an unthanked job, personal freedom to people who are often locked, not by virtue of their own illness, but by virtue of their caregiving responsibilities in the house, about financial freedom, and also about restoring some of the values that drove the decision to make health care free for everyone in this province, at least free at the point of consumption years ago. Just now understanding that health care goes well beyond what happens at one or the other end of a stethoscope and is about a range of social interventions. So look, this is, this is a, a new approach to policy. It's a new approach to policy for a couple, three reasons. It's a new approach because we've used things like long-range scenario planning. Jerry Coe and Catherine Sorotnik who are in the audience today, the people who've driven this for us. Brian Hayday was instrumental in making sure it gets done. It's new tools like Google, Carlos Rizzo and Neil Seaman are in the audience today from the innovation cell that's contributed work up here. Uh, and it's a new approach because it's very outward looking. We started doing policy in a very crowded room, which is a little frightening. Every public servant is bound by an oath of secrecy, actually. We're not supposed to talk to people until we're ready to talk to people. So we've gotten into a vulnerable position here. And we're advocating that we go even farther on this and start to talk to a lot more people. I'm here talking today not to make an announcement, but to talk about an issue with you. So it's a new approach for us in those, uh, in those three ways. Uh, I'll stop just by saying thanks to the people who participated in the exercises, those 300 people, unpaid, uh, bad sandwiches, the usual government deal. Uh, and at the end of the day, I guess the millions and millions of people who are actually doing the caregiving in the province right now. I think I've come within time, and I'll say thanks. So we have a few minutes for questions, and, and maybe I'll just start. I can't help but think that this is back to the future. But with my, my Dutch uh, heritage, a lot of this stuff sounds very familiar. You know, I was born at home. My mother died at home. Um, healthcare was never mentioned. I don't know what the word in Dutch is for healthcare, actually. I'll, I'll think about that. But that should make it a little easier if you deal yeah. with older guys like me. We understand really well. So anybody got a question for Staining? Here we go, right here in the middle. Just give us your name before you ask the question, please. Yeah, Alina Gildner from McMaster University. Um, a lot of the solutions, I th or some of the solutions, first of all, I want to say uh, the solutions the ministry itself is coming up with are great. Thanks. And um, I want to jo join the voices that are, are telling you so. Um, some of the solutions I think that are most exciting, like urban planning, uh, taxation, employment issues, et cetera, remind me of the old population health arguments where um, you it, the question was really about getting other ministries and departments on board as well. Um, I won't ask you to speak out of school and say whether or not the, the provincial government um, is spearheading anything like that, but what do you see as the prospects uh, for doing that? And, um, yeah. um, you know, if you could tell us whether anything is underway. I know that Cabinet Office has a, its yeah. new health and social policy, but social policy isn't what you're talking about here sure. um, exclusively. So what are the prospects for that? Sure, well, well you're also kind not to ask me to <laughs> <laughs> I say what I really think. Look, it's, uh, <laughs> 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 it's a bit of a Canadian tragedy, right? 1974, the Lalonde Report, we took a leadership position on population health and we stayed stuck there for the next three decades as the rest of the jurisdictions got ahead of us. Uh, we haven't figured out how to do this. Where I think this starts to get perhaps, where there's a little glimmer of hope, is that it's really now unavoidable. We can't talk about population health as being over here. What we're really talking about now is population health care. And maybe as we start to reframe it, at least in the currency that we understand of transactions and services and so on, we'll be able to make movement on that. I think there is some glimmer of hope. We have cross-ministerial committees now that are trying to deal with some of these broader issues, and I think that's a, a very positive step forward. Uh, and you know, building on both your comment and Anton's comment, there are some very compelling models out there. There's a lot of jurisdictions. Anton talked about the Netherlands. Uh, you can look at places like Finland. They don't attack a health problem within the Ministry of Health. They pull a whole team of people together to look at this. Uh, you know, in standard sort of Ministry of Health, perhaps a little 
uh, interesting fashion, we're reaching out into the system right now with these sorts of initiatives uh, to try to pull in a broader and broader perspective. And we're acknowledging our system is beyond the usual institutions that we transfer money to. It's, it's on us, though. The responsibility is very much on us to try to draw connections between the other ministries, the other levels of government, and all the community agencies that can really help us here. Staney, can you stay for a few minutes for a scrum sure. outside? Sure. Then we'll be on time as usual. I'd like to thank you very much for coming today, Staney. And on behalf of the audience and our supporters, we are making a donation to a charity of your choice. Thank you. We appreciate you taking the time. This will all be online uh, very shortly, probably about a week, though, before it's there. And you can go over it again in your own mind and uh, on the web. Thank you for coming to Breakfast with the Chiefs. <laughs>